In the previous video, I talked about how to create basic particle systems. This was in Object Particles, and it was pretty straightforward. Unfortunately, it wasn't very robust. Now, there is a way to create your own particle systems, but it's a lot more in-depth, but at least you get to control what you want to control. And for this, I've created one object. Here's my object particle system. Inside, I've got a lot going on, but I'm just going to go through each one individually and try to let you absorb it slowly. Now, my draw GUI is just drawing some information about how many particles exist and the frame rate. And this will be the frame rate that is real, which means it's not capped by room speed. So we don't have to worry much about that. It's not really to do with particles. The most important part right now is create. Here's where I initialize my particles. I can create a particle system. This is like a container or a house. This is like where the information for all your particles will be stored. It's a system. Like I said, think of it like a house or a container or a box. To create a particle system, the function is part system create. There are no arguments for it. Then you have to store it in a variable. This is so you can call upon it later. So I'm going to store this particle system in a variable called parsis. You probably want to be a little more detailed with the variable, but for the purposes of this, I'm just going to call it parsis so you know that it's a particle system. I'm going to ignore this part about setting the position for the particle system, because I'll get into it later, because it does affect where the particles will be in the room based on not only the system, but also things like the emitter and anything else. So that's a little too in-depth right now. I'll talk about it later. Then, once we have our particle system, our container, we need to put particles in it. And for that, you need to create particle types. So once again, part, and the function is type create. And I'm going to store that in a variable. Once again, you have to store this in a variable so you can call upon it later. Also, you want this one to be robust. You want it to have some sort of identifier, like snowflake or whatever. But for this, I'm just going to call it par type, just so we know that it's a particle type. Like with the basic particles, you can trigger your particles to affect during any event, really. And for that, I'm going to use global left pressed. But of course, this could happen at the end of the animation, you know, when something explodes or, or whatever. But for the purposes of teaching you, I'm just going to put it in the left press so it's every time I click my mouse button. And here's the one script. It's my particle stats. This looks like a lot of information, and trust me, there's even more information than this. Particles are very in-depth. So I'll try to show you as much relevant information as I can. This is taken straight out of the Game Maker manual for the order in which to do the stats. You don't necessarily have to do it in this order, but I find it's the best way to do it. We're going to start with this portion. Choose an image for the particle. Just like in the previous example of basic particles, we need our particle to take some sort of shape. For that, you do particle, type, and then shape. We're defining the shape. Now, we need the index first. So we're defining one of our particle types. Now, we only have one, and it's called par type. And then, you choose from a list of particle types, PT, and the shapes, and then what you want. So let's not choose pixel, let's get a drop down. These are all of the shapes that GameMaker has built in. We have circles, clouds, disks, explosions, flares, lines, pixels, rings, smoke, snow, spark, sphere, square, and star. Now to help you out, I'm going to open up the manual and show you what each shape looks like. So here they are. These are all of the shapes that GameMaker has pre-built of course, you can actually use your own sprites as particles, and we will get into that. But just to keep things simple right now, I'm going to use one of these basic shapes. Let's use stars. So I'm going to say particle type shape, and I'm going to choose the shape star. Now we get to choose the size and scale. So once again, particle type, all of them are going to start with particle type. 
and I'm going to define the size. Now for this, once again, we have to tell GameMaker which particle type we're affecting, and I'm going to affect particle type. This is why in the create event, I stored the creation of my particle type in a variable, because you have to call upon it every single time you affect it. Now we go through a lot of arguments about the size. What we're doing here is defining how small and how big the particles can be because when they're created, they choose randomly in between these two numbers, size minimum and size maximum. This is done on a percentage scale. 100% is one. So let's say I wanted 0.5, so that's 50% of its regular size, whatever that might be. Like if you had your own sprites, it'd be 50% of the sprite size. And let's go up to 1.5. So every particle that's created will be created somewhere in this range. GameMaker will choose between this number and this number. Our next argument is size increase. This is during the lifespan of the particle, as long as it stays on screen, should it change size? Now I've already written, yes, it should negatively change size, so it should shrink. And I'm going to shrink it by 0.01 per step. So it's not really a big change. That would be 1% of the original size. Every step, it'll shrink by 1%. Then there's size wiggle. Wiggle is a term that defines the fluctuation of whatever you're changing, in this case the size. So while the particle exists on the screen, I'm allowing it to fluctuate its size, like, like wobble and wiggle between small and big as it goes. Rather than steadily decreasing in size, I can also set it to grow and shrink like every step, just back and forth, kind of like a wiggle. For the purposes of this, I'll just leave it at zero. So that's how you define the size. Now let's go into scale. Once again, we're going to use our particle type because that's the particle we're affecting. And then there are just two more arguments, the X scale and the Y scale. It's actually pretty easy. What you're doing is once again, as a percentage, one being 100% of the original size, changing its height and width, how much it stretches on the Y scale and the X scale. So if I don't want it to stretch at all, I don't really even have to use this function. But let's say I do. Let's say I want the particle to be wider. There we go, 200%. So it's twice the size in the X scale, but it's going to stay at a regular size height-wise with the Y scale. So it's wider than it is taller. So that's how you can affect the width and height of the particle. The next section deals with how our particle will move once it exists. Let's turn off all of these comments. The first stat I want to deal with is speed. This is how the speed can be affected while the particle exists in the room. First you pick the minimum speed. This is similar to how the size worked. Minimum and maximum can be in between any number you want, but I've chosen 5 and 10. So when each particle is created, it'll pick a random speed between 5 and 10, including 5 and 10, and that particle will move that many pixels per step. Of course, if I don't want it to be randomized, I can pick the exact same number. Now I know it can only be a speed of five. But let's have them be randomized. Similar, once again, to speed, we have the speed increment. This is how the speed will be changed per step. This is measured in pixels per step. So I'm making it slow down because I'm going to be constantly subtracting speed and I'm going to subtract 0.2 pixels per step from whatever the randomized number is of each particle. Once again, we also have wiggle. So this is how much the speed can fluctuate. Now, 20 is really, really big. Let's pick 5. So it can fluctuate between 5 and 0 pixels per step which is going to add to whatever its original speed was. So as it's slowing down, it can still kind of like feel like it's going a bit faster and a bit slower every step. It kind of warbles or wiggles, which is the use of the term. The next stat is direction. So we're going to apply that to our particle. Then we pick the minimum direction. Now, if you remember, direction is like the degree of a circle. Zero points to the right side of your screen, and then it increments one degree all the way around the circle counterclockwise. So when my pixels are created, 
they're going to move between 45 degrees and 135 degrees. So if this is 0, this would be 45, and this would be 135. So the pixels will go up between this 90 degree arc, which is 45 degrees and 135 degrees. Then we have the increment. Should it change directions over time? And I've got a decreasing direction. That means it's going to move to the right a little bit over time. One degree per step. Let's get rid of that for now. Then, should it wiggle in degrees? And I'm going to say no, I don't want it to wiggle. So, right now, my particle will move at a speed between 5 and 10, and it'll go somewhere up between a 90 degree arc. So I'm going to be shooting confetti up into the air, which look like stars. The next one is gravity. You can actually apply gravity to your particles and define where it goes. So we can define the amount of gravity, so that's how much gets pulled away from the speed over time, and it'll keep increasing like gravity does. So I'm going to apply 0 0.3 gravity, and instead of 90, that would make it go straight up in the air. It's already doing that. Let's go 270. Once again, 0 being right, if we go 90, 180, 270 is straight down. My particles will go straight up between a degree of 90. And then, after enough time, get dragged down with the gravity. Then I can change the orientation. This is the rotation of the actual image of your particle. Once again, you can pick a minimum and a maximum. I've chosen 0 and 359. That's an entire circle. So my star, rather than being straight up and down, can actually be rotated in any direction. Then you can, once again, increase the angle. I'm saying no, I don't want it to rotate over time. You can also add wiggle, as before, should it wiggle back and forth in its rotation. And this last argument is angle relative. This is a true or false one, so let's say true. Could be also be 0 or 1. This means should the angle of our sprite, our image, point in the direction that it's moving? Should it be relative to its motion, to its original direction, which is up here. Those are all of the movement stats I want to go through. Now let's go through colors and blends. There are actually a lot of these, and I'm only listing a few, so I'll try to also tell you what the other ones are about. The alpha I've chosen is particle type alpha 2. There is alpha 1, 2, and 3. What that means is... Alpha 1 takes one alpha argument, alpha 2 takes two alpha arguments, and alpha 3 takes three alpha arguments. If you remember, alpha is a transparency channel. It's how opaque, how visible the particle should be. Alpha 1 sets one static transparency. Remember, this works like a percentage, so it's between 0 and 1, which is 0% and 100%. If I use alpha 1, all of my particles would be one straightforward opacity, the entire lifespan of the particle. If I wanted my particle to change its transparency over time, I would use 2 or 3. 2 sets the starting alpha and the ending alpha. How transparent it should be when it's born and how transparent it should be when it dies. 3 sets not only its life and its death, but also how transparent it should be halfway through its lifespan. Let's just use alpha 2 to show its change. I'm going to start it at full transparency, and we're going to set it to 0 when it dies. So it's slowly fading away as it lives and dies. Now I get to set the color. For this particular one, I've chosen RGB because it's what I'm used to. But you can also choose hue, saturation, and value if that's what you are used to. I'm going to apply it to my particle type, and now there are six additional arguments. The first two deal with the red channel, then the green, then the blue. And what you're doing is you're setting a minimum and a maximum value that that color channel can have when the particle is created. Setting everything to 255 means that all channels are maximized, which means it'll be a white color, and it won't change over time. If I did want it to change to a random color, I can set the minimum red to 0 and the maximum to 255. Really, I can choose any number in between, 
but I want the maximum amount of color change. That means when this particle is created, my star, it can be anywhere between 0 and 255 red, and I'm going to make it anywhere between 0 and 255 green, and 0 and 255 blue. So it can be any color. If you need a refresher on how color works, especially RGB, I do have a video on color. Now, similar to alpha, I can make it change over time. I can use particle type color, and then I can choose one, two, or three. Once again, it'll ask for one, two, or three color arguments, and it'll do the same thing. It'll have a color at its birth, a color halfway through, and a color at its death. But since I don't want my particle to change any kind of color, I'm going to stick with just defining the RGB color at its birth, and then each particle will stick with that one color all the way from life, all the way to death. You can also blend colors with the background, or really anything that's behind this particle. And you do that with blend. You just tell GameMaker whether you want the blend to be true or false. In this case, the blend type will be additive. I haven't done any videos on blend modes yet, and it is kind of a tricky subject to wrap one's head around. So for now, I'm not going to use a blend type until I actually go into blend modes for you. But just to let you know, it is there if you want to blend it. The next portion deals with the lifespan. This is how long the particle should live. And for that, you use life. For this function, you just set the minimum and maximum life of each particle. So when it's born, it'll choose a number between the first and second number, and what this means is how long it'll live in steps. Now my room speed is 30, so I could put room speed instead. And that's probably a good way to do it, because if I multiply my room speed by a number, that number, to me, means seconds. Because my room speed is pretty much how many steps there are in a second. So there will be room speed, 30, times, let's say, one second. So the minimum life is one second, and let's say my particles can live up until three seconds. So whenever a particle is born, it's either going to live between one and three seconds and anything in between. There are a few more functions that deal with what happens when your particle dies, but I'll go into that when I talk about emitters. Now for the last step. Once I've defined every single one of these, and there are more, and I encourage you to look through the Game Maker manual to find more ways to manipulate the color, or the lifespan, or what have you. But once you're ready, you now need to somehow create your particle, put it on screen. And I'm doing that, if we go all the way back to how we started, I'm doing it with Global Left Press. Here is how you create one instance of a particle. You use part, then you say particles, then create. And for this, we need to define which particle system I'm going to be using. Now we only have one, it's particle system, but you could have more than one system. So I'm telling GameMaker to look inside that box, that container, that's what a system is, open it up, find out which particle type in that box I want you to use, because you can have more than one particle type in a particle system. And in that case, I'm going to use particle type because it's the only one I've defined. Argument two and three are where you want the particle to be created. And I'm going to do it on my mouse X and mouse Y. Naturally, because I want it, when I click, to be where my mouse is. And then, number. This is how many particles should be created when I do this. Now, why this is important is because you have to imagine you've gone through all of this and you've created this really cool explosion. And you want that to happen when an enemy dies. So you would say maybe at end of death animation or, or whatever your variable is for when the character dies, even when it collides with something and its instance destroy, then you say part particles create, the particle system, the container you want game to open up, where you want it to happen, and you probably want it to happen, you know, at the X and Y value of the instance that's being destroyed. Then you want to know which particle to pull out of the box out of your particle system, which is probably your explosion that you've created, and then how many to have. You could probably have one or two or whatever, probably one for an explosion. But anyway, getting back to what I'm talking about, I'm just going to open up my particle system container, and inside, at my mouse X and Y, pull out my particle type, which is my star. And I'm going to create one of them. And now, for the grand finale, 
Here's what it looks like when I put all of this together. Okay, so here's my room, and as you can see, I don't have any particles in it right now. Now, my frame rate is being kind of capped because of the recording software I'm using, so it's being capped at about 60 frames. Normally, you could go much higher than that. So, if I click, I will create a particle, which should be my star, and if you remember, it should be wider than it is tall. It should move up somewhere between this 90 degree angle, and then fall off the screen and fade away. And there we go. I forgot, it also rotates. But there it is. I'm creating one star every time I click. You can see how they're picking some sort of angle between 45 and 135. And then they're also rotating all over the place. And eventually the gravity, see the wiggle too? They've got that wiggle that I set and they're falling back down. Now I'm gonna quickly set up one more for you guys to take a look at, really fast though, so you'll have to pause the screen and look at all of the settings I used for this next particle setup. Okay, so here's what I created. I created explosions that move up, little puffs of red smoke, and as you can see, as I make them, the particle count is going up, but over time, they're being destroyed, and my particle count is going back down. One last thing I need to say about particles, and I'm actually sorry that I left it for the end, but particles, when you create a system or a type or an emitter, GameMaker will buffer a space in the memory of the computer that's creating the particles. So what you need to do when you're done with your particles, here I've done it at game end, you need to destroy them. This is done with particle, and then you either do system, type, or emitter, and then the word destroy, and then which one you're destroying. So part system destroy was parsis, part type destroy is part type, and part emitter destroy, you have to say which system it's inside, and then which emitter you're talking about. It's important to destroy all of your particle systems so that you don't cause a memory leak from your game. While your game is running, this may cause the game to slowly degrade and lag because it's taking up too much memory. Also, it's important that when the game closes, in this case I'm using game end, you destroy them so that once again, you don't cause a memory leak in the computer. Most of the time, GameMaker will handle anything to do with memory for you. But in certain cases, and one of them is particles, you actually have to maintain the memory yourself. So just as a word of caution, please destroy your particle systems when they're no longer needed in your game. In the next video, I'll talk about how to create emitters so you don't have to click around to create particles. <laughs>